From the far reaches of the Milky Way galaxy, it's Retro Nerd Girl with a watch, react, and review for you. I am going to see what's available on Amazon. I tried going on Netflix and I couldn't find any like retro movies. I found a lot of new movies. Um, and the movies I did find, they were, there. a lot of them are movies I already own and I plan on actually reviewing in depth. So those wouldn't work. Um, I think there may be one or two movies that, um, that I might do from Netflix. But uh, for now, let's just look on Amazon and see what we've got. Ooh, I see a good one right away. It's Missile to the Moon, released in 1958. A nice oldie movie. I have never seen this one before. So um, let me see. I'll read you the synopsis. Two escaped convicts, Gary and Lon, are caught hiding in a rocket ship by scientist Dirk Green, who forces them to pilot the ship to the moon. Dirk, who is secretly a moon being, wants to return to his home satellite. Dirk's partner, Steve Dayton, and his fiancée, June, stow away on the ship by accident. Will they all make it back safely? Wow, that's a lot to be giving away in the synopsis. I think there might have been some spoilers right there. Hmm. Someone needs to rewrite that uh, synopsis on IMDb for sure. So this film was shot in black and white but the version that i'm watching is has actually been colorized i think um you may if you look on youtube there may be a version of this that's actually in its black and white form but i want to see it in color because it is a fantasy film and sometimes seeing it in color will give off that fantasy vibe we're looking for um or it's more sci-fi fantasy all right 20 minutes in the film starts out with a very television style music, but it's very expressive, full of a variance of emotions before anything even happens. So you get this enti entire score happen and nothing actually happens. You're looking at like title credits and things like that. So that was interesting. The music goes dim or fades out and then we get right into this extremely low budget production um, and but you can see that they did have money um, or they had access to a few sets here and there the story starts off with Dirk and his partner Steve being told that their rocket ship has been confiscated by the government the film did a really good job of setting up that Dirk really wants to take this rocket ship to the moon and he'll do almost anything to make that happen to the point of even being a little bit crazy you know <laughs> now when two escaped convicts Gary and Lon stow away on the rocket ship Dirk gets this really cool idea to use them as manpower to pilot the ship to the moon before the government takes it away. And this was all set up by the synopsis I told you before, but it, the film actually goes into detail and explains all of this out for you, which I, I think was, is really important to really get the gist of what's going on. And we get the plot of the story by 20 minutes into the film, which is good. It's a good start. I mean, there's nothing worse than being like 45 minutes in and still not really knowing what the plot of a film is. <laughs> so, so there we have one great uh, attribute of the film. Let's take our wins when we get them. <laughs> now, you know, I enjoyed all of the details of the, the technical details of the film, like the control panel monitoring the ship's activity on the ground and the window view of the model of the ship is just those little those little things that they didn't really even have to do but they did you know go the extra mile to show us that visual and helps us to really feel like we're we're understanding the film and the visuals correspond with what they're talking about 
Now inside the ship, there's a plethora of switches, knobs, and levers, and lights. All of the little things that, you know, I look for in these old sci-fi films, and I enjoy them so much because I love that old technology that at one point in time, you know, the people of 1958 thought that that was how ships ran and it was advanced. It also lent a practicality to it. There are, you know, the characters are pressing levers, so they must be doing something, right? <laughs> The film also does a good job of, of establishing that the convicts are at odds with each other. They're, it's not all like two pals. They're actually a lot different from each other. One is, um, his name is Gary, is a, is a thief that is really proud to be one and he's a bit of a bully at the same time. A very unlikable character. Lon is um, the other a uh, convict. This is a gentler and more reasonable kind of character in his thinking with honest regrets about having done his crime. In a crescendo of ridiculous events, it puts Steve and his girlfriend Jane on the rocket ship just as it's about to blast off to the moon. And, you know, as rudimentary as the visuals are, they still do a great job of conveying the actions in the film so far and you know I'm really enjoying this. Now 50 minutes in the pacing is really really fast. They were really trying to build up a lot of momentum in this film and you can feel that energy because one thing really leads to another leads to another leads to another uh, until it gets to a place where it gives you a heap of exposition and I mean a heap of it. <laughs> um, on the spaceship uh, where we left off, um, Gary is looking at Jane like a ham sandwich. And it's like, oh boy, this is a recipe for disaster. So what do you know? Immediately, all of the guys clear out the, uh, the room, leaving Jane alone with Gary. He attacks her, and it's, it's pretty, like, um, awful. But uh, he gets his comeuppance. But just as he's getting his comeuppance, the ship gets attacked by meteors. And in the mix, Dirk, who's leading this exposition to the moon, is killed. But before he dies, he gives Steve a medallion and tells him he's going to need it where he's going. And so much really happens in such a short period of time. It's like, it, it, it's almost slaps you in the face with action and stuff happening. So if you look away or you leave the room for a second, man, you could be uh, totally out of the loop of what's going on in the story. <laughs> now, once they land, um, they face off with these rock creatures and then go through a cave. They're gassed and kidnapped by these blue Amazons that live on the moon led by a blind queen that they called the Lido. And, you know, this, is, this world is a complete male fantasy. It's a paradise, if you will, for men, filled with exotic, visually stimulating women who are curious about these men that are visiting their world. With a character like Gary around, he's really taking advantage of things. So um, they single out Steve because, of course, he's wearing the medallion that Dirk gave him. And they think he's Dirk. And, you know, this would be the perfect time for him to say, hey, guys, I'm not Dirk. But he doesn't because he just wants to find out what's going on. I mean, that makes sense. But you're already starting off on the wrong foot, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so it seems as if Dirk really was sent to Earth when he was a child, to learn about the planet and then return, oh, well, not that when he was a child, but he was young, and to, to learn about the planet and then return to marry a woman by the name of Alpha, okay? And Alpha is the second in command to the Lido. I'm going to actually watch the rest of the film and I'll get back to you when <laughs> that's over. All right, guys, I watched it to the end, and wow, the last part of this really plays out like a fever dream, full of action, and the pacing really revs up to 100, okay? 
through the roof with pacing. Um, wow. There's a cat fight between Jane and Alpha. I kind of expected that. There's a fight against Wills, like um, psychic, like a psychic fight. Uh, there's some mic mind control. Um, there's, in fact, there's a lot of mind control. There's a tribal dance sequence. And then we have the glorious giant spider puppet. And if memory serves me correctly, this is uh, a spider that was used and reused in at least three or four films. <laughs> Which brings me to the fact that this film is supposed to be uh, the actual remake of another film that I reviewed here on this channel called Catwomen of the Moon, another glorious 50s uh, sci-fi movie that was uh, was of an Amazon woman-based theme released in 1953, five years prior. Well, there are so many similarities in the two film, but one thing that they removed was the strong and smart scientist leading lady. And... I mean, it, it doesn't really give women a good look at all when you have cat fights in the movie. But at the same time, this is a movie that's also featuring women leaders and leadership roles. However, this version in this film is way more exciting and schlocky than the first. Uh, of the many features of this film, the costumes of the moon women are really, really elaborate and heavily ornate just just amazing work that was done on these costumes and just the look itself is very they're very exotic and beautifully um crafted the only thing i really have a problem with were the wigs that they seem to be very jarring a little stiff and some of them uh they had a very helmet look to them very um cheap helmet look to them and I, I i didn't love it all but i still thought that they were really cool i love the concept um uh the the visual concept of the moon women in in particular and i actually enjoyed the idea of having them be blue um there's no technical reason for it but it just they look like aliens with the blue skin and so it works here somehow. It's kind of cheesy, but it works with the, the colorization that was added to the film. There, now there are scenes showing the ship landing and taking off that looks like they got actual real stock footage and put it on a projection behind a photo or a drawing. Many of the backgrounds were just flat drawings and they didn't try to hide that. It's a sad product of the lack of budget, but even like having an artist really make a matte painting that looks realistic, of a realistic quality, would have really upped the quality of the film. Now, one thing that I hate to have to comment about is the acting. I mean, it's so funny at times. It's really hard not to laugh at it, but I think this is one of the reasons why I love these films. The filmmakers were going to make this film no matter what. And to be totally fair, must a lot of the acting seems to be directly correlated to unrealistic dialogue and strange editing choices. And speaking of the acting, a standout in the film giving a rather an entertaining performance was Nina Barra, who played Alpha. She's the over the top, way over the top. She was actually a regular on the sci-fi television series Space Patrol from 1950 to 1955. And you know this is the kind of stuff I just love. So this is a good old-fashioned guilty pleasure of mine with all of the wonderful B-movie splendor of the 1950s. Well, that's my watch, react, and review, and I hoped you liked it. Let me know what you think of the film down in the comments. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can support the channel by doing so and hit the bell icon to be the first to get my next review. This is Retro Nerd Girl signing off.
Take care, movie lovers. I'm off to my next review.